So, as you know, we are giving a share about brain deaths. A deep halakha share about brain deaths. Somehow or other, uh, the first share was exactly was about brain deaths. We got involved. And somehow or other, we sort of got to Moshe Mendelssohn, the next two shares, Moshe Mendelssohn. And then we, then we got involved in a little bit about the shop site three. And about the chicken without a heart. And since we're totally derailed, totally derailed, and totally off subject. And I'm in a particularly good mood today because we just celebrated. No, no, no. that I'd be ecstatic. No, no. I'm in a particularly good mood today because I just celebrated my great nephew's bris. And he's named after the Alta Narola Rebbe, Chaim Yechiel Mayer, Chaim no, Yechiel. And I have affinity to uh, Narol because I am the Skan of Bezden of Narol. You didn't know that. Before I came to Ars I had the prestigious position of being the uh, vice president on the Bezden of Narol. At 16 year old, I already was appointed to this position. And you'll ask me, what is this position? Uh, in, what, what, what did this. What does this comply of? Well, when you sell the chametz, when you sell the chametz on Pesach, right before Pesach, you, the, you do a lot, a lot of different type of kinyanim. You do every type of kinyanim possible to make sure that the guy gets the chametz, so, right? And another thing, when they have a bezdin that officiates over it, so it makes it more official. So the rebbe would call me up every Arab Pesach and say, "We need a bezdin." I'm like, "Rebbe, I'm only 15 years old. Don't worry, you you qualify." So. I was called in to the, go to the shul, so the, there was an Arola Rebbe, my friend and me, and every year it was the same story. He would call over this, uh, it was actually a real estate uh, agency, the realtor, who was across the street, he'd call him over. This guy was black. He was so black. <laughs> when he walked into a room, you couldn't see any, it, 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 was a it was a shadow of the light, you know, <laughs> obscure the light. And, and he was a great guy, he was a, a great guy. And every year it was the same story. The Rebbe would look at him, for a second or two and say, Leroy, you know, if you're Jewish, we can't tell you the, we can't tell you the chametz. And Leroy would look back at the Rebbe and say, Rabbi, just like I told you, last year I wasn't Jewish, and the year before I wasn't Jewish, and this year I'm not Jewish either. <laughs> and every year it was the same, same, same guy, same black guy, and every year we sell the chametz, every year it, start, it would start these ceremonies, the same thing. <laughs> last year I wasn't Jewish, the year before I'm Jewish, and this year I'm not Jewish. And this was my uh, claim to fame before I came to Arzmech as being the Skan Abedin. But we are, uh, so therefore, since I'm in a very, very good mood, I, I'm going to do something a little bit different, and I promised you I was going to do it next, last week anyway, and go a little bit more into the fight between Rabbi Yanis and Ibshitz and the Yaivitz about whether or not Rabbi Yanis and Ibshitz had any connection to being a, a uh, related to connected to Shop Say Svi, right? A fancy way to say to the sab Sabation, we'll just say connected to uh, Shop Say Svi, right? So someone asked me, Rabbi, fine, what is this uh, werewolf in Transylvania? Last I checked, it was uh, Count Dracula in Transylvania. So I said, don't worry, I have read Bram Stoker's book, Count Dracula, it's actually a book before it came out with 10 million different type of uh, crazy Dracula movies. There's a book, and I'm well aware that there is, you don't know there's a werewolf in Trans Transylvania. I will be uh, revealing to you that there was actually a wolf in Transylvania that has a lot to do with our subject. Okay, so what did we say last week? We said that, that uh, we were talking about the chicken without the heart, and we said, oh, maybe, maybe that's why uh, the Yaivitz, the Yaivitz is, is Yaakov Emden, was upset at the, uh, was upset at Rabbi Yannis and Ibshitz, because Rabbi Yannis and Ibshitz was a young man, argued on his father, the Chacham Svi, and maybe that's what was going on, why Emden sort of hounded, Rabbi Yaakov Emden hounded Ibshitz and made up a story that he was connected to Shab Sai Svi. That was uh, Rabbi Ruben Magolius' take, which again, is not so uh, satisfying to say that, yeah, that, that uh, the Yaivitz just made up a story, or... He didn't say he made up a story, but he was influenced by, by his previous biases against him. And of course, we know that the, uh, we said Geshen Sholem and many, many others in the, in the uh, secular world say not the sure he was connected to uh, uh, Shab Tzai Tzvi, Rabbi Yonatan Aibshin. Okay? Now, uh, I'll just start reading here 
something from a uh, professor in uh, from guy in uh, Professor Emeritus. The Emden Archers controversy erupted on the fateful Thursday morning, February 4, 1751, when Abiyako Emden announced in a synagogue in Altona that an, an amulet ascribed to the chief rabbi, we have Jonathan Ipschitz, could only have been written by a Sebastian heretic. The controversy between these two rabbinic titans continued unabated until Ipschitz's death in 1764. After Ipschitz's death, and then continued to wage the battle against Ipschitz's memory and against his descendants and disciples until his own death in 1776. Okay? The controversy was never really resolved. It ultimately has subsided only with the death of all the precipitants. Right? So everyone's dead, no fighting anymore. When all had participated, while when all who had participated in it died, the controversy entered a new phase, namely a scholastic one, in which history historians took turns condemning or defending either Emden or Ipschitz. The second phase was still thriving in 1989, and there appears to be no imminent danger that it will abate in the years ahead. So what are you saying? Still They're still fighting about it. Now, a little background about this. The Haredim do not fight about this. The Haredim, their stances don't get involved. <laughs> the official stance is that probably Abshitz was, Rebjarnitz and Abshitz was not, was not connected to Shop uh, Street, but they say whatever it is, don't get involved. They say the only person who can get involved in this type of issues of these great Gedalim is a person who, when he eats and drinks, has no pleasure. I Meaning someone who has asked, someone who's totally otherworldly, then he, he may get involved and decide who he wants to go like. But if you're not that type of person, which no one is, leave it alone. So, I am a part of the credit camp, I'm all part of the credit camp, and officially, don't get involved in this question. Well, and, right and that's the truth. The truth is, we learn over Rabbi Emden's safers, we all learn Rabbi Yaakov, uh, Rabbi Aisha's safers, everyone learns it. Don't even know that, people don't even know about this, unless they, they, right? So, but bottom line is, I do feel that at least you should know a little bit a little bit you should know what we don't get involved in. You should know what we don't get involved in. Okay? So again, my official stance is everyone is Nazik, everyone is right, we don't get involved, it's none of our business. And really it is, let's think about it, what he said there. This, everyone's, the only ones who's fighting about it is people in 1990 who most of them are not from. Most of the people who write about this now are not religious. It's like a secular type of study and it's a scholastic type of thing. He happens to be, he happens to be from, he's a, big, he's a big expert on it. He's a a professor um, emeritus in Brooklyn College, but most of the writings I saw were from not from people. Peter the Mick, how many books are, are written on the subject? 17. Zillions! They themselves, Rabbi Yaakov Emden and Rabbi Ipschitz wrote many books on the subject. They themselves wrote many books on the subject. Rabbi Yaakov Emden saying, you are a shop, says me. Rabbi Ipschitz said, you know what you're talking about. I'm not. There were journals, there were books. It was, it was all over the place, right? He wrote a book, uh, Rabbi Yaakov Emden wrote a book, uh, Rabbi Ipschitz wrote a book, Lucas Edus. Rabbi Yaakov answered him back, the uh, Ayavis answered back and said, Shiva Lucas Aedus, breaking the, the, the Lucas Aedus, okay? Okay. So, a little background. There were two areas that Rabbi Yaakov Emden attacked Rabbi Yenison Aibshitz. But for now, I'm going to call them the Ayavis, because it's easier to say. The Ayavis and Rabbi Yaakov Emden. In one area was, in one area that he, uh, that he attacked him, was about certain books that were attributed to Rabbi Yonis and Ipschitz, attributed, and it had a lot of uh, Kabbalah in it that sounded a lot like what Shabtai Sri's followers held. Yeah, last week I gave you a little bit, I can't go into it because you have to know all Kabbalah, you have to know a lot to understand what the deviation is. But it had to do a lot with what is God's relationship to the world, are there like two gods per se, what is the, what is the, in, there's a Pusik in the Chumash about, in the beginning of Beresh, it's about Taninim, God created the big big alligators, right? So we just read that puzzle again, dinosaurs or something. In Kabbalah, it's a big, big thing. It's a big, big thing. And the Shab Sai had a whole big, whole big story about what these Taninim were, what they were, how they sort of, they sort of rescued God, a whole crazy thing. A whole crazy thing, it's crazy. But as crazy as it is, it seems like there, were, there, was, some, there was something to it. At least there was some intellectual, I don't know, truth, but something, some type of intellectual, I want to say honesty, but some type of something that could be, could be plausible in some way. So, be the way. So, one way that Rabbi Yaakov Emden attacked Rabbi Yaakov Emden says he found books that were attributed to Rabbi Yaakov Emden that go 
according to this type of school of thought of Kabbalah of, 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 of Shabbat You have to know, there are hundreds of books about the Kabbalah of Shabbat We don't have them anymore, but they're there. You go to the library, you'll find them. Written by his students, written by him, hundreds of books on the Torah. It's called Torah's Shabbat It's not like something out of kindergarten here. There's something real here, right? Okay, that's one thing. We will talk about that later, maybe a little bit more about that about the books that were attributed to the Bjarnes and Eibshin. No. But the more exciting thing is the Kamiyas. That is the more exciting thing. And today we'll go a little bit through the Kamiyas to see what are Kamiyas, that amulet. And uh, uh, Yannis and Eibshitz was a well-known Baal Shem. A Baal Shem basically means someone who knows how to write uh, amulets and knows how to like do uh, Kabbalah, Kabbalah Masi, sort of. And he was well known for it. Everyone knew about it. He wrote many, many amulets, and even the game went in for amulets. And he charged for it, even. He made a little stick of Parnassa for it. And it was well known. And Rabbi Yaakov Emden one day got his hand on some of them. And he opened it up, and he had a shock of his life. Now, he opened it up because he already, he already thought that maybe, he already had different reasons to think that Rabbi Yannis and I should have something to do with, uh, with Shop to see. He opened it up. And he said, that's it. This is, this is a clear indication, a clear indication, a thousand percent, that Rabbi Yannis and I just, is clearly a shop they see followers. Now, what, what I want to say, what I want to say like this, before I said there are books that Rabbi Yannis and I just supposedly wrote that have the terrorists of shop see, have the same type of learnings, same type of leanings. In those books, it doesn't say shop they see per se. It talks about Mashiach and Mashiach Halal Duaveris. He's above Torah mitzvahs Mashiach. But it doesn't say actually in those books the word shop they see per se. But in the amulet, Rabbi Yaakov Eden said he opened them up and it says they're black and white shop they see. Oh, that's pretty incriminating. Okay, so what we're going to do here today is we're going to go through the amulets and I'll teach you how to read, write one. And you can make a big parnas out of this. <laughs> of course, I don't suggest you use these because <laughs> these may get you in trouble. But before we do that, before we do that, I want to show you a well a well known legend that they taught us in elementary school. Who's us? Uh, those of us who went to <laughs> Yeshiva Elementary School. Look at this. Not enough for everyone. What? Is this a crossword puzzle? No, it's Sukato. What is it called? What is it called that thing in that game? Sukoto? Right, here. I didn't bring enough. I didn't realize we have such a big crowd here. Okay, so So let me again. I wanted to show you how that Rabbi Yonatan Eibschitz was well known to write Kamiyas. This is not an incriminating Kamiyas, this is actually a good one. It's not even a Kamiyas. We'll see what it is. So I'm going to translate it into Hebrew. There was a story, I remember hearing the story from my Rebbe. I remember him bringing this inside to class. And there was a story, I'm translating the second paragraph. There was a uh, governor, Hegmon, in, in Metz. Where's Metz? Metz is in France, very good, that's right. And uh, Rabbi Yannis Eibschitz was in many places. He was in Prague, he was in Metz, he was in uh, the three communities, we'll talk about that soon. Eva, we'll see that, what that is in a minute. Anyway, and there was a Gaza Girush, there was a, a terrible decree of, of exile, of uh, being thrown out of, the, uh, of town. Okay, so Rabbi Yannisin, who was a friend, quote unquote, of this governor, said to his, this governor, come on, you know, uh, uh, give us a break. What are you throwing us out? You know, what is this business? So the governor said, you're out of here, guys. I don't want no Jews here. You're the source of all our problems. You're out of here. So Rabbi Anderson said back to him, you should know. Sha'am Yisrael chai lo'el me'ad. The Jews are going to survive. They live for, for they're everlasting. And you'll never, uh, you'll never vanquish them through your decrees. Okay, that's what he told the, uh, you know, that's what he told the governor. Fine. So the Hegmine, which is the governor, said, you know what? In an hour from now, I'm, 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 I'm uh, ordering the decree, and that's it. But you know what? I heard that you know how to write Kamias. Tell me, how many Jews live in Metz? So Rabbi and I said he knew because he was a rub there. 45,760. That's what he told, the, uh, that's what he told the, the governor. So the governor said back to him, listen, I know you write Camillus. If you could write that sentence, you just told me, what did, what did, what did your Bjarne and I should just proclaim? I'm your soul, 
Am Yisrael lives forever and ever. So the governor said, take a small piece of paper, the size you usually use for Kamiya. If you could write on that paper 45,760 times that sentence, I'll let you go. There won't be, I'll, 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 I won't uh, enact this decree of exile. That's what he told. You write 45,760 times that sentence. What sentence? So, uh, Gabriel said, I said, no problem, give me, give, give me an hour. He comes back in an hour and he presents him with this. He presents him with this chart. And he told him on this chart it says 45,760 times this sentence. You never heard it in the Cheder? Am Yisrael Chai Laol Me'ad. Right? That's some reform hater. Right? And, and, and the, uh, the governor said, really? The gover and uh, Rabbi Eitzhak said, yes, I promise you. So the governor said, you know what? Let me count it. And it says over here that it took him a year to count it. And it was exactly 45,760 and there was no exile. That's the story. Now, now just to show you, I'm not going to do the 45,000 times over here yet. Just to show you how this works. It's very simple. It's not, it's not the rocket science. Let's go to the first iron. You see the first iron? The middle one. Yeah, the first iron. Right? You call it one olive if you want to call it. One olive. Right? You go straight up. You get, you get, you get, uh, go straight up. I'm you so, I'm you so high, low mead, right? You do an L. You see that? I'm you so high, low mead, right? That's one. Right now, go up to um, one test. One test. So you'll right, go up until I'm yes until the yud. Right, I'm Yisro. Well, chai. Now, if you want, you could go. Left right. You could go two two boxes and go up one box and go ahead. You could go three boxes, go up one box. And go this way. You can go many, many different ways. Are, are you seeing it's hard? It's very hard for me to show it to you. But if you just look at it, you can see it right away. It's very easy. You just look at it, you can see it right away. As you go, as you, as you go down, you have more. The, the, the faster you make a, the faster you make a turn, you have you have more uh, options, right? You getting this? You getting how to get this? Right, right. So if you take each quarter, you have eleven thousand and something options. 11,440 options. And if you do four times 11,440, you'll see you have 40, you see you have 4,000, 45,760. Right? Right? You see, are, you, are you following this? You get, it's hard for me to explain it, but. Each quarter. Each quarter just as So you times by four. You get right now. Now, now you all, you all guys went to uh, high school. Yeah. Who graduated? And you could, sit, you could sit for a year and try to figure this out. And that's what, supposedly, according to legend, this is what this governor did. Or you could use what we call the Pascal Triangle. That's what we learned in high school. The Pascal Triangle, which, which is what I'm going to translate it. You could use the Pascal Triangle, which basically uses something we know that's called binomial coefficients in the binomial theorem. And you, you learn this, 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 this is simple algebra. So here it is over yeah. there. You come to me afterwards and I'll explain it all to you. In a, in a very short time, you can figure this out. You don't got to sit and count it for a year. If you use Pascal theorem, now, you can figure it out very quickly uh, that this is, this is that, that 45,760. Now, you're like, whoa, Pascal theorem. So who was Pascal? Who was Pascal? Blaze, right? Blaze. I don't know how to say the French. Blaze. In some way to say, Blaze Pla Pascal. So we are theologians, right? We are students of the religion. So we may not know about the Pascal Triangle, but we know about Pascal's Wager. Everyone knows about Pascal's Wager. No one knows about Pascal's Wager. Yeah, you know Pascal's Wager, right? So in the good old days, they, the, 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 uh, the educated people, they didn't only do math and science, they were also religious. So Pascal is a famous, famous mathematician. He did a lot of work in uh, computation with fluids, uh, hydro something, hydro, how do you call it? Hydro, hydrocolic, whatever. Hyd how do you say it? Hydraulics. Hydraulics. And, um, but he's also a theologian, and everyone knows Pascal's famous wager. What's Pascal's wager? You never heard it? The Pascal's wager says like this. He says, listen, 
He says, you can't prove whether it's a god or not. You can't figure it out. It's something that's it's unknowable. It's unknowable. So, you're in the world, is there a god or isn't there a god? There's no way you can know. That's what he says. No way you, know. you got a choice. You got a choice. You could choose there is, there is no god, or there is a god. Now let's see what happens if you, make, if you get the wrong choice. If you choose that there is a god, but it happens to be there isn't no god. There is no such thing, right? I'll fill up a mind. No such thing, right? So what do you lose? A cheeseburger. Eh, maybe you couldn't sleep till 10, you have to make up for chakras. Whatever. You lost some finite pleasures. You lost something finite, right? You lost something finite. What did you lose already? So you, you kept some, it's not so bad to be religious. It's not so bad. Well, you lost this. You, you had to, you couldn't eat shrimp, whatever it was, a couple of things you couldn't do, right? Okay, so if you bet wrong, if you bet wrong about there is a God, that's what you bet, you bet there is a God, so what you lose? Something finite. But let's say you bet wrong the other way. Let's say you, you, you bank on there is no God, and there really is. The loss is going to be infinite, hell forever, a loss of paradise forever. So Pat, that's called Pascal's Wagers. He says, listen, it's really hard to figure out if there's a God or not. It's really hard to figure out. But, so let's say it's 50-50. You don't know. You might as well pick that there's a God. Because you, the, loss, the loss to the game of picking the God side, of picking the no God, is much greater. Like I said, if you pick the no God, you could be, you're going to have an infinite amount of hell, infinite amount of, 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 of punishment, and an infinite amount of losing pleasure in the next world. And if you pick wrong, if there is no God, if there is a God, what do you lose? A cheeseburger, you lost something, a little something. That's the famous, you never heard of this? Pascal's Wager. That's Rabbi Gottlieb, Pascal's Wager. Now, is this a, I would not have, and he has books about it, he has a book about it, and he, has, he puts it mathematically, Pascal's Wager. I knew about Pascal's Wager. Yeah, they taught me in uh, yeshiva, Pascal's Wager. I said I don't want to, you know, a question about from. They say, sit down, I said, you don't know Pascal's Wager? Now, the truth is, the truth is, this is not, he, he's coming with presumptions. His presumption is that you really can't know. It's, you can't know if there's a God or not. You really can't know, and therefore, it's just like, either there is or there isn't. So, it's like a 50-50. But he's also coming with an assumption that, okay, no God, or is a God? But let's say there are 5,000 religions, and each religion says, if you don't do their religion, it's, can't, it's tantamount as if there is no God. So the, the, the numbers actually change. It would, he would be right if there's only, yeah, God, no God. And then it's a 50-50. But the Christians say the Jews are going to hell. And the Muslims say, the Christian and the Jews are going to hell. And what did the Jews say? Everybody. Bomb everyone, Hama. You know, <laughs> you know everyone's going to hell. It's, a, it's, not, it's not so simple that it's just, it's not one against one. Anyway, I would not hire, I would not hire Mr. Pascal for working or Samach. That's okay, because he died in 1662. So he's not, uh, okay, but it's very famous. You guys should know Pascal Wager. Okay, you heard it first. But besides that, we could use Pascal's triangle uh, where, what happened to that guy who was, he had a PhD in mathematics over here? Where did he go? Akiva? The cool guy. Akiva Fish? Oh, no. Not Akiva Fish. Not Akiva Fish. Yehuda. Yehuda. What happened to him? Not sure. He, had, he oh, would yeah. explain this whole toss. Uh, he just disappeared. Anyway, the kids are... The tall blonde guy. The tall blonde guy. He's sitting in the back. Yeah. He was in my rock most year. Okay. But anyway. So here it is. Oh. Uh, okay. So w now, is... You have to know something. I have to be honest. This is what we taught in, this is what we taught in elementary school, and I remember seeing this, and uh, many of us being blown away. Wow, 45,000 times in this little, and I started counting it. You know, after I got to four times, I said, okay, I believe you, you know. And, and now, how ingenious is this exactly? First, first of all, the chances of the story happening are really weird. Really? That's what, that's what the governor said? Oh, I know you happen to write Camille's. And I know that how many Jews are there fit in the number of this sentence that you said into the Kamiya, the 45,000. I mean, what are the chances that actually happening? It sounds very, very uh, apoc apocryphal. It sounds very, very strange. But being the May, it could very well be that uh, Rabbi Anderson Aitchis knew, he definitely uh, knew, he knew of Blaise Pascal. He, Blaise Pascal was a very famous guy, very famous. He died at what age? 
39 years old. I couldn't believe it. Blaise Pepperdine is 39 years old, but he doesn't make. If Dennis and I should just live 30 years after him, there's a very good chance that he knew this trick. You don't have to be a genius to figure it out. If you know Blaise Pascal's, uh, Pascal's triangle, and you know the binomial coefficient, if you know this, you can, do this, you can figure this out yourself. It's just, you just gotta you just plug in the numbers. So, it's just something tells me that maybe this never actually happened, but Peter the May, like the famous story with the Chavetz Chaim, what's the famous story with the Chavetz Chaim? Oh, the Ghana, the the right? Basically, uh, the Chavetz Chaim was called to be a character witness, and the lawyer said, you know, judge, well, the Chafetz Chaim is really honest. When he was, once he was, got robbed and he chased after the Ganev and he told the Ganev, I'm Michael, you, I, I pardon you, I pardon you, I pardon you. It's okay. You don't got to give back to me. I don't want you to get punished to go to hell because of me. So the judge says to the lawyer, you expect me to believe that story? You expect me to believe that a person actually did that? The lawyer said back to the judge, whether he did it or not, I don't know. But no one says those stories about me and you. That's for sure. No one says those stories about me and you. So that's the point here. Whether the story happened or not, but no one says the story about me or you. So the point was to show that he was a real, 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 real genius. And by the way, I looked online. You have to know math to understand. It's not so clear. Even if you know the Pascal uh, triangle, it is true that once you have it, it's very easy to figure out. But you still have to be pretty smart to make the, to make the, uh, the chart originally. You don't have to be that smart, but you do have to know a thing or two to be able to make the chart. Anyway, this is what we, this is what we learned in elementary school. Take it home and show it to your kids. So be the make. These are not the uh, incriminating. Let me put this over there. For, this is for me that I, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get confused. Now, so now let's see. Now, now we're gonna show you the actual Kamiyas, the amulets that were incriminating. So I'm going to give out this page first. The writings on the side, I'll just explain what this page is. The writings on the side are mine. We, I don't know if we'll refer to it or not. We're not going to go through every, every single one. So you would figure, anyone who's learned a teeny bit of a Kabbalah knows uh, that, that it could get very, very complicated. It could get very, very complicated with the permutations and the numbers. It could get very complicated. So I was like, uh, you know what, I'm not going to even try to do these comedians. Forget about it. This, who knows what's going on up here. But then I said, you know what, let me see what they are. Let me see what they are. I want to see. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, hey, I can read this. It ain't so bad. So let's see. Why did I show you these? Because these are notarized. These are actually notarized that you could still find in the government offices of... Of, of Mets. That's where they were notarized. Well, because what happened? What happened was, Rabbi Yadis and Aish and Rabbi Yaakov were going, going, go, going crazy. It got to fisticuffs. It got to a lot of fighting. There were a lot of people on the side of Yadis and Aish, a lot of people on the side of Yaakov Emden, and they were actually fighting in the street. It got really, really nasty. And the government, the government got involved. The kings got involved. Everyone got involved. Right? In the good old days, it wasn't, it wasn't like, like we have nowadays, a separation of religions in America. The, relig the, 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 the religious uh, community was over, were somehow or other controlled by the king and the government. Anyway, it was very, very nasty. Rabbi Yaakov Emden got thrown out, Rabbi Yaakov Emden got thrown out. It was terrible. It was a bad situation. But at one point, the king said, we want those kamiyas, those amulets, to be notarized, which is very important. Because part of the fights were, what? Did he write these amulets? Were they not right? What, what, were they written? Were they written? Were they transcribed right? Weren't they transcribed right? So, this is why these are the most authentic am am amulets that we have, because these were notarized. So, what do we have here? Let's, let's look a look at it. Let's see if we can read this a little bit. So, we have here actually five amulets. These are five separate ones. I boxed it off. You have A, B, C, D, E. And for those at home, we're going to have everything in a link, hopefully. But B to the May, so let's look at B first. You see there's a, there's a, a mug and dove a bunch of words in it. Some of the words you can read, some of the other words you can't read. Look at the, uh, look at the, um, the, 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 
the wording itself in the amulet, meaning the lines in the amulet, the verses in the amulet, you can't read one word. Not, it's insensible. None of these words make sense. Right? What does it say here? What? You, you can make any sense of this? Right? Maybe a few words here or there. Most of the, most of the words make absolutely no sense. Right? Right? Look at, let's say, let's say, look at amulet A. Amulet A, even the words inside don't make any sense. The, the words inside the uh, star, and then there's all these sentences. They don't make too much sense to me. Right? Oh. Okay, so you say, I don't know, whatever it is, it is. Right? Oh. But says that Yaakov Emden said, he knows how to, he knows how to uh, decode these amulets. And it's not so hard. He says all all this is is the is the is the is using the old uh, code called atbash. Now, let me give this out. This is the amulet himself. There are five amulets. This is the safer Svas Emes, which the uh, not Svas Emes from Gur. The Svas Emes of Yaakov Emden actually showed you how to decode each of these amulets. How to decode them? So there are many animals, like 30, 40 of them, but I'm only going to do these, these five. So here it is. It's not hard. It's not, it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult to, uh, to do. It's really pretty easy. So, for example, let's just start something easy. You see, in the, you see on page, the first page of the Sas Emes, I wrote the Atbash code. We all know what the Atbash code is, right? It's very simple. Aleph is tough. Aleph is tough. Atbash means... You 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 uh you trans you uh, you you change the aleph to tough, base to shin, gimel to resh, right? The first letter of the alphabet is aleph, the, the last one is tough, right? So you uh, sort of transpose it. So and that's that's a very simple way of of a code, right? If you are working in intelligence, I don't suggest you use this code. <laughs> it's not too difficult to break this code, right? Okay. So let's see. Let us look at. Let us look at. D, you see D? Look at the, uh, look at now at this paper. Look at this paper. Look at D and where I wrote one. You see D1? D1. And go on the bottom, I wrote one here. So what does it say there? It says base, 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 tough, mem, yud, mem. A nonsensical word. Base, base, tough, mem, yud, mem. But if you use the at bash code, which the base turns into a shin, the base could say some of the words don't you don't gotta change. Base soft mem turns into yud. You got shapsai, yud turns into mem, and the mem is the mem. Shapsai Melech Mashiach, right there. Right? Look at it's, it's, you got the Atbash code in front of you? You got the the Atbash code in front of you? Very simple. In the Atbash code, base turns into a shin. A base turns into a shin. So the first base you turn into a shin. The next phase you keep, the next uh, tough you keep, the next mem you turn to yud, because in the apash the mem is a yud. And then you got mem mem again. Shapsai Melech Mashiach. There you go. If you want to uh, do another one, let's do uh, two. Look at C. Look at the amulet C and the number two. So in the star, you see these words that make no sense. Hey, bays, bays, tough, mem, hey. So if you use at bash, the first, the hey turns into a sa sadi. So you got uh, sadik. You could, you could say it's the thing. It means sadik, sadik. And the four uh, letters in the middle are shapsai. So you got sadik, shapsai, sadik. Right? The hey turns into a sadi. The base turns into a shin. Right? Okay. So you'll say, now, I'm not going to go through the rest of them. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. This shapsai to me is all over the place. I, I did, I can't go through it because it's all over the place. So you'll say, wait a minute, Rabbi, fine. Okay, you know, maybe it worked out, shops I see, at Bash. But, but who says that that's the way you work this amulet? Who says that's the way you work it? So the truth is, it's seemingly that's the way you work it because all of these sentences that make zero sense, if you use at Bash, they make perfect sense. For example, let's start with, which one should we do? Let's do A. Let's, we're looking at amulet A. So, we're going to look at the Svas Emes. 
and he using Appbash is very simple. Using Appbash is very simple. I checked it out. It's a hundred percent that way. Using the Appbash code, look what you get. Look at the top of the word. Look at the top of the page. First page. Vishem Hashem Alekei Yisrael Hashoichim B'Tzveres Uzoi Yochad Muyucha B'Yichad Elyon U'B'Shoish Hanelam Elekei Meshichoi Shabtai Tzvi Asher B'Chevrosoi Nir Palanu Oh, and, and you're like looking at this. That's what it says. Yeah, that's what it says. If you use Appash, that's what it says. J -j Just look. I did it a little bit. Uh, look on top. I, I, I just did a little bit on top. B'shem yud hey pei hey. If yud hey pei hey, the pei could turn into a vav. That's Hashem. Aleph beis hey mem. If you change the lamid, the beis turns into lamid. The mem turns into yud. Using Appash. Anyway, you go through it. If you, if you guys want to do something, go through it. So... You're like, shop size three right there. You have to remember, shop size is dead already for 100 years. He's already died 100 years ago. I mean, this is ludicrous. Now, so you guys are going to take this package home, and what you're going to do is, I was very kind. If you want to really work on this, you'll see, I, I lined it all up. So here we have uh, A. Really kind. So here's A. So you have E. Here's E. So it's two pages, so it goes to E1 to E2. See, it's all there. It's just all there. It's not, you figure it's like so difficult to read. It's not difficult to read at all. What's the X? Oh, the X is at the, it's supposed to go to the next page, but we don't, uh, we're, not, we're not using it. For, for, it's, just, it's, just, it's just all there. Here, here's another one. We want to do C. We want to look at C. C. So I have C over here. It tells you how to read it. Over here, telling you how to read it. B'Shem Hashem L'Kei Yisrael, El'Kei Meshichai, Shab Zaysi. Again, the same thing. Look at look at that. See, you can see on top. If you do the atbash, that's what you'll get. Wow, this is pretty damning. This is pretty. This is pretty incriminating, right? So, and they're all like this. Oh, I'm only showing you five. Yes, these are the main, these are the main five because we know that we know that these were actually exist. Now, why do we need to know? Because Yaakov Emden was sometimes exaggerated a little, exaggerated a little bit, but this we know is happening. So this this really does not uh, sound good. Now. What happened was like this. Rabbi Anton Eipschitz was a rabbi in Metz, and then he moved to a place called the Street Communities, called EVA. It's an acronym. Uh, Hamburg, uh, what is it called? Altona, and uh, Wandsbeck. Wandsbeck. These are in Germany. Anyone from Germany knows these places. Hamburg, Altona, Wandsbeck. He got the position. This is a very prestigious position, and yet Rebecca Emden happened to live there. And Rav Yaakov Embin, and there were a lot of people, a lot of uh, uh, mortality deaths by, a lot of people were dying by birth. Women were dying by birth, and children were dying by birth. So he started giving out these amulets, Rav Yarnis and Ipshitz. Some of them worked, some of them didn't work. Be the May, Rav Yaakov Emden got his hands on these am am amulets, and he opened them up and he said, uh oh, this, this is Shop Size 3, 100%. And then he said, let's bring, in the, let's bring in the other amulets that he gave out of Mets. So these are actually not the amulets that were in, in uh, the street communities. But these are the ones that were from the Mets. And this is where every, everything went crazy. Everything went crazy. OK, now, so what are you going to say? And, th and this is what, that was, what? It doesn't look good. It doesn't look good for Rebbe Anton Eichel. On the other hand, it sounds retarded. Rebbe Anton Eichel could believe in Shabbat Zvi. The guy became a Muslim. The guy is dead for 100 years. It just sounds retarded, right? It's, just, but, but it's pretty criminal. So they asked Rebbe Anton so Eichel, what's going on in here? You know what he said? He wrote a whole book about this. He says, Rabbi Yaakov Emden has no idea what he's talking about. He has no idea how to read this amulet. It has nothing to do with Apash. These are all names of God. They, they are not sentences. Meaning, what Yaakov Emden did, he made this into a, a very understandable paragraph. It's a very simple code. This is not Einstein stuff over here. Very simple code. Very, you know, a code that you use in fourth grade. This is not a hard code to break. And he got a whole sentence, a whole sentence. All this makes a lot of sense. Most of it. At the end, he, it's too complicated. At the end, he does a took him, whatever it is. If you want to come over to me afterwards, I'll, I'll read it. I'll show you exactly how to read it. And Rabbi Anderson, I said, you have no idea what you're talking about. That's not the way you, and I, I, that's not the way you're to come here. These are all God's names. They have absolutely no connection. Each word has no connection to the next word. And these are all God's names. And there are no sentences here. There's no connection over here. And you don't know what you're talking about. Now, you're like, really? 
Are you telling me Rabbi Yonatan Aisha, it just happened to be that through Atbash, you got a perfect fra- fra- paragraph that mentions Shabbat Shalom every single paragraph, and it happens to be that that's not the way you, you that's not the way you use it. That's not the way you interpret it. That's not the way you read it. Really? Right? It so it sounds so mind-boggling. What are the chances are that you're telling me you have these words here that no connection, no atbash, it's all the names of God. It happens, it happens to be that if you do the atbash, you get all this. So the Haredim bought this. They said, we believe him. The secular people said, there ain't no way. <laughs> there ain't no way. That's why, that's why the secular, the, the scholastic or the uh, a- academia, the academics, they are all that he was definitely had a connection with Shabbat Shalom. Right? Now, you'll say, oh, Haredim, oh, the academics. Well, my friends, this was not a fight just between Rav Yaakov Emden and between Rav Yonis and Ibshis. The Pnei Yeshua got involved. The Grog got involved. The Neg Debi Yehuda got involved. The, everyone, was, everyone was involved. So the Pnei Yeshua, who was 10 years older than Rav Yonis and Ibshis, uh, put him in Cherem. He put a bandit tonight to the chariot and he defracked him. Defracked him. They took off his frock. That's why I don't wear a frock. I don't want to get defracked. Right? right? They defracked him. And uh, uh, Pnei Yeshua called up a bandit tonight a couple times and come down here, come do tshuva, come explain yourself. And Rabbi Yonatan is not the younger than him. He's only 10 years younger than him. He says, go fly a kite. You know, the Pnei Yeshua, but Pnei Yeshua wasn't going to go at that point in time. No question about that. But the Gura, who was much younger, the Gura, who was much younger, much younger, like 70 years younger, uh, the Pnei Yeshua said, no, he's right. Rebbe Yonatan is right. That's, he, he, he's correct. You don't read it with Su'atbash. There's nothing to do with Atbash. So it's like, I, 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 it's, just, it's just so bizarre that it would actually not be the way he interpreted it. Right? Now, it is true. If, it's hard for me to go through it. If, when you go through it, there are a couple of letters that even Rebbe Yaakov Emden says, I don't know what they're doing there. A couple, very few, very few. Uh, I'll show you here. Over here you have a couple letters that he doesn't know what they are. It's really easy to read. It's really easy to read. It's just too long. And he says, you know why they are put in there? That to, to throw off the scent. Let's say, let's say you have like 500 letters. There's three or four extra. So Yaakov Emden says, I know why you put it in there. That people shouldn't realize what's, what's being said here. And, but the Rebbe Yadis and I says, no, you don't know how to read this thing. And these are not extra letters. And these are God's names. And you have no idea what you're talking about. All right? So this was the major, uh, uh, major issue about the Kamiyas. You'll take this home and you will uh, go through it. It's really not too hard to read. Now, now, another thing is to say you have. The, the thing is, when 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 Chapter Three died, there were many, many groups that, that broke off. We're not talking about 10 people, we're talking about 100,000 people. But there were many different groups that grew up. Some of the groups said, become Muslims. Some of the groups said, we should all do a virus, and that will bring Mashiach. Some of the groups said, no, you have to fast all day, and you have to do penance all day, and you have to do tube all day. All right? There are all different types of groups. So to say that Rabbi Yerdes and Ibshit didn't keep halakha, it's like retarded. I mean, he wrote, that's all he did, he wrote books about halakha. So to say that he was, it's called an antinomian. An antinomian in Christianity, or antinomian, you do whatever you want, and you just believe in God and everything is wonderful. That's an antinomian. On the other hand, on the other hand, like I said, there were a, a lot of these shops I see people were big time in Islam. And they were, it was very irrational. Their Kabbalistic uh, uh, understandings were, we believe in irrationality. So they would do a lot of irrational things. They would, I mean, I don't be, they would fast, the next day they would do, or it was, pretty, it was bad news. It was bad news that was going on over there. They would fast for many days and they'd do many Averis. Things are a little crazy. So it's very hard to judge this. So I'm just giving you a little bit of a background. Now, now, so we did the Kamiyas. We did the Kamiyas. Rabbi Yaakov Emden said that when Rabbi Yaakov and Aisha's wife died, that Rabbi Yadis just couldn't help himself and he put on his wife's grave Shabbat Shalom's name. Wait, 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 right? Meaning, what's going on here? Rabbi Yadis Aisha says the whole time, I am not a Shabbat Shalom. He says it black and white. It's not, Rabbi Yadis Aisha denies it. He's not willing to go in front of a rabbinical court of the Pnei Yeshua. He's not willing to demean himself. 
But he denies it. He says, I have nothing to do with Shabbat Shalom. I have nothing to do with Shabbat Shalom. And he put, he made a cherim. He put anyone who's part of Shabbat Shalom. Rabbi Yannis and I should put everyone in cherim who has a connection to Shabbat Shalom. And Rabbi Yaakov Emden said, nah, he's lying. He, he really is a Shabbat Shalom. That's what they all do. They all lie. And the, okay, that's what's going on over here. Okay. So when, he, when, when his wife died, and of course, Rabbi Yannis and I just blamed Rabbi Yaakov Emden for his wife's death because the, the, he went through a lot of sorrows. Rabbi Yaakov Emden got up, oh, look. The man can't help himself. Even on the grave, on the tombstone, the epitaph, he puts Shabtai Tzvi. So this is this one. We'll see if that is correct or not correct. Uh -huh. uh, oh, so now, this is supposedly the epitaph, that's what's written on the tombstone, of Rabbi Yonatan Eichus' wife. If you notice, on the first line, you have part of the tomb, of the lettering are emboldened, are large. So could anyone figure out what was the name of Mrs. Yonatan Eichus? Anyone can figure it out? Shira. Uh, Shira, that's, that's good, that's close. No, but no, no. Where is my paper? Oh, oh, here it is. Well, first of all, the introduction to this. Mrs. J Mrs. Jonathan Eichert's epitaph, a grave matter indeed. Right, you get the pun? Okay, so this is, this is where I got this from, a grave matter indeed. So you can see very clearly her name was Elkali. El El Elkali, Elka, that's a Yiddish name, Elka, Elkali, something to that effect. Okay, so that's why... That's why the first, the ayin is big, the laman is big, the kuf is big, and the, and the laman is big. Great. But then all of a sudden you go to the other side of the sentence. What's big? Shabzai sadi. Holy cow. Shabzai sadi. On the, on the grave. So Yaakov Abedin says, even when, he went crazy, Yaakov Abedin. says, even on your, you have to desecrate your wife's grave? You got to put Shabzai C on it? Okay. Fine. Now, he wrote a book about this called Petach and Nayim, and I guess the Yerdes and I just had it. He didn't answer. He, he, he didn't. He, he didn't answer, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The was well respected. He still had a huge following, and he's like he's a super duper uper. He probably got fed up with all of them. I'm not, he, he didn't want to answer anymore. So this guy, Miss Professor Sid Z. Uh, Lehman or Lehman, uh, his name is like Shlomo Zalman. They call him Shlomo Zalman. He's a firm guy. He said. Wow, this is pretty, this, 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 this is pretty bad news. It looks pretty bad news for Rabbi for Yerzen Aichas. He couldn't help himself. He had to put Shabtai Tzvi on the tomb. So he, he went to a library where they have all the tombstones, a picture of all the tombstones in the Altona uh, graveyard. And go to page 137. And this was the picture. It was a picture. And he's like, he's looking at this picture. There's nothing large. There's, there's, no, there's nothing. And he's like, oh my gosh. Now again, Rabbi Yaakov Emden was known to exaggerate. That's, I don't know if I get to that part of the shir. But he was uh, very uh, vociferous, to put it mildly. He was very outspoken. He, he went at it. So some people didn't, didn't believe everything he said. He was, he was a little bit too uh, vehement about it. So, he, so this guy, Sid, uh, uh, said, looks at this, says, oh my gosh, that is not there. So he starts thinking, maybe, maybe what happened was, maybe Yonis and I just felt bad, or his community got, felt bad, so they changed the grave, they changed the grave, the gravestone, they changed the tombstone. So this was in the book of, Rebbe, on page 134, it's in the book of Rebbe, of Rebbe Yaakov Emden, incriminating Maybe you're tonight, because it's the shin base stomach uh, soft yud is big and sadi. So this guy Sid Lyman, uh, uh, Professor Lyman, went ahead and said, "Let me really, I want, let me see what the tombstone is." So there was a in the library. They had a some type of book that had all the pictures of all the graves of all those tombstones in the Altona graveyard. And sure enough, this is what he opens up. Doesn't see anything incriminating. Oh, I can't believe Yaakov Emden lied that. You know. He didn't say the truth. He said maybe they changed it. Do you know what Sid did? He got on the next plane. 
to Altona. He took the next plane out to Germany. He got on a plane. <laughs> he got on a plane and said, got to figure it out. Because he wanted to see, maybe he could tell that the, the, the tombstone was changed and the original tombstone was exactly like where Yaakov Emden had it. He goes to, now go to the last page. He goes to the last page, the very last page, the very last page. And there's a tombstone. There it is. It's, that's where it is today. And he realized that actually Yaakov Emden was right. And what was in the library, just for brevity's sake, they just, they didn't actually uh, write it exactly the way it was lined up. It's large letters and not large letters. So what was in the library was just not real. So what was in the library was just a, a basically a shorthand or just a, uh, a, a shorter way of, of, of putting it down. So back to square one. We're back to square, wait, wait, we're not there, right? We're back to square one. Look at page, look at page 140. 140 is what the tombstone really looks like and it was true and the, the picture from the library was uh, disingenuous. Fine, so look at it. Look at the, there we go. Look at the, the right side, we got the Elkali, that's her name. And then on the left side, we do see there's a Shin and a Beis and a Tuf and a Yud. But then if you look, there's also a Sadi that's big, there's also a Ches that's big, there's also a Kuf that's big. So if you look at it, what what do we really have here? Let's look at let's look at the big forget the sh forget the forget the uh, shin shin your your hey at top. We'll get that in a minute. We have here on the left side Elkali. Then we go to the right side, Bas, the daughter of Yitzchak Zal Shapira. It happens to me that Mrs. Elkali's na da name was Elkali, Bas, Yitzchak. It just happened to work out if you take the shin on top and you take the base and the samich and the yud and the sadi, you get shapsai with the sadi, which sounds like shapsai three. But if you look at the whole picture, it's actually just her name. It's just her name, Elkali Bas Yitzchak Shapira, right? So this now let, let's read. Well, just, I'll just read you this tombstone for. Uh, uh, what does it say here? You look at the tombstone on, on uh, 140. You test nepach le devay le kina. She raw. So she died in your tevis. It turned to a day of, of uh, laminations. And and now, what's a she raw? If you ever open up books, a lot of times they they, they let's say, what's this year? Tough, what are we, Tuff Pei Gimel? Yeah. Right? No, Tuff Shin Pei Dal, wow. You got I didn't realize. <laughs> I gotta go pay my taxes, right? Tuff Shin Pei Dal, no. So right, so a lot of times, they use a, di different. They use a different word, they use a different word. Tuff Shin Pei Dal is just what? 783. So a lot of times you'll find, especially in, in books, they'll use a different word. A different word with the same number. What year did she die? She died in the year 515, right? She died in Tuf uh, Shin. Uh, she died in, um, uh, 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 she died in the year uh, Shin and Rage. She died in 515, right? So he could have used, he could have used Tuf Kuf Yud Tesvav. That's what we would do. We wouldn't call the year 515 Tuf Kuf, Tuf Kuf uh, Tesvo. But he wants to use the word Shiroi. So Shiroi is also 515. What does Hey Kuf stand for? The Prat, the, the Prat Cotton. I mean, she didn't die in the year 515. She died in the year 5515. We're not in the year Tuf Shin Pei Gimel. We're in the year 783. That's a stone age. No, that's before Abu Rabinu. We're in the year 5000. 780, but we don't say the five, right? What year are we in? Five, seven, eight, four. Five, seven, eight, four. But we don't say the five. We say tough, shin, pay dollar. We don't say, hey, tough, shin, pay dollar. Where's the thousand? I guess they figure if you don't know which, if you don't know which millennium you're in, you're in bad shape. You know, we can't, if you can't figure that one out, you ever go to the, whenever I go to uh, get a, get a, I get a visa. So, sitting there. 
Because all you see in Bacha comes out with me. What's what today's date? It's the 20th. Got to come second. Yeah, but what, what months are we in? You know, you know, every time, right? You see Bacha Lamb, the man of the man. So, so we, 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 we just say Tavshin paid dollar, but really mean 5,000 Tavshin paid dollar. That's what it means over here, too. Leprat Katan means. The fact that it means the small numbers, meaning it's really 5,000 shiroi. Okay? Now, the question is, why did he use the word shiroi? So, Yaakov Emden says, oh, because he, sh- he wanted to get the shin in there. He wanted to get the shin to follow the... He wanted to get the shin, the bait, right? But that's, that's not... That's not so, he wanted to get the sh- He wanted to get shiroi there because he wanted to say, if you look at the opening, it says here, Yud Tavis, a turn into yes. sadness and eulogy of song. I mean, the song turned into eulogy. Yes. So he wants to use the word shiroi. He's using that to say the, the year so that it could fit into the sentence. You got it? Please and I guess if Jacob Emden would say, yeah, but it's too close. Come on. Come on. It just worked out. We got shin, pay. It's just, if you look at Rabbi Yaakov Emden, the way he writes it, it's also a little bit not... The way he puts it in the first page, it looks like the shin is right on top of the base. It's not exactly right on top of the base. In the real, in the real, look at the real, uh, look at the real uh, tombstone. It's a, the haze on top. It's the haze on top. Okay, it's still, what should I tell you? Rabbi Yaakov Emden felt that he used the word shiroi because he wanted to get the shin in there. He should have used tough kuf. Tesvav, like they got the word shin in there because that we should get it that it should at the end of the day shin it should get shopsai sadi, right? And this guy uh, Sid Le- 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 Lehman, even though he did believe that Bernstein Eibshitz was the shopsai sadi guy, but he said this is not a good proof. This is not a good proof. He's not buying this proof. He's not buying this one. This, this, but on the other hand, this is a little funny. You got shopsai sadi there. Okay, I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, what the, uh, s- the scholars do with all, you know, this is what the, we're learning, we're learning faith, and we're learning, this is what they're doing. This is they're trying to figure out if your life just is. Okay, so where are we holding here? Oh, Rabbi side. Rabbi side. Now, oh, well, I, I must get to the wolf part. We got to, we got to the, uh, we got to, there's another reason why, whatever. I can go on and on and on here. But let's get to, let's get to the punchline here. So what's going on here? Like we said, this was a war, that a raging war. The Ramchal was involved, the Groh was involved, the Yehuda was involved, and I said Rabbi Yaakov Emden, basically Rabbi Yaakov Emden was said the Ramchal was a Shabtai Svi guy, Rabbi Yaakov Emden said at one point, the Groh was a Shabtai Svi guy. He was going crazy. Uh, that's why, that's why he, he lost some of his credibility, because he started attacking everyone. And he kept saying, I know I'm attacking everyone. He was, he, he read it. You read, his, you read his biography, he actually has a biography uh, called McGill Safer. And this is a biography that Art Scroll would not have printed. This I can guarantee. It talks, you gotta read this biography. It talks about his, his struggles with uh, girlfriends. It's like, it's like Yaakov Emden over here. It's like Yaakov Emden. It's, a, uh, it, it's, a re, it, it, it's something you have to read. Uh, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, there was a book that came out, uh, The Making of a Guddle, right? The son of Yaakov Kamenetsky, which I knew, Rabnasa Kamenetsky, he mentioned that was something that maybe Rabbi Aaron Cutler maybe wrote a letter to his kala that said, you know, I like you or I like to dress or something. I don't know, something like, oh, they put the guy in hair. Oh, God forbid. You know, you know I, remember, I remember I was dying to get the book. I wanted to see what it would say. That was so bad. But you couldn't get it. If you want your book to be sold, make sure you get someone to put a hair on it. Then it'll be, it'll go like, it'll go like hot cake. Be, it couldn't find it. The, play, the, the books went so out. That's what you're was so controversial. They, they were sold out. And I finally, got the, I, I finally got the book. I'm like, look at weird, 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 weird. I, I can see something racy, something. Garnish. Nothing. There was nothing there. He, he had struggles when he was young. He wasn't sure if he was going to stay learning or not. Nothing. It was nothing. It was nothing. He wrote a, he wrote a letter to his girlfriend, uh, to his colleague. Ridiculous. But you want to see a good book, you open up McGill's Safer. That's, that, right. that, that's, his autobiog- that's his autobiography. Then you're going to see a book. Peter May, I am definitely. Uh, what were they talking about? Oh! So who knows who Joseph. Who's, who knows McCarthyism is? This? Who knows who Joseph McCarthy is? Yes, uh, 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 What? Very good. McCarthyism. So it was a little bit like that. That you felt like Rabbi Yaakov Emden sort of like started attacking everyone. 
a lot attacking everyone, right? McCarthy said that everyone was a communist, right? And everyone became a communist in, in the Cold War. McCarthy basically put like 3,000 3, people out of business. And the phrase called McCarthyism is basically where you witch hunt someone to make him loot because of his supposed uh, political views. That's what it sounded like a little bit. Beat the mic. You have to understand something. You have to understand something. As crazy as it sounds, you have to know, already at that time, there's a guy named Jacob Frank who had 50,000 followers. It's not talking about the, a little steeple down the block, a break of minion. Jacob Frank, who was a big shop say, guy, he says the reincarnation of his, and he became a Catholic at the end of the day. Uh, because he had a whole Torah, Shafi has become Muslim, he'll become a Catholic, and then everyone will be Chuva and everything will be wonderful, all of them become Jewish. And he's like, okay, Jake. No, he had 50,000 followers. And who took over Jacob Frank? His daughter. His daughter, Eva Frank, Eve Frank, and she was the first female messiah. How to hear, right? The Christians don't have a, we're much more liberal. We got a female messiah. You know, that's right. So, so there, was, there, there was a lot, there was a lot, a lot going on. And it also had to do with enlightenment. Because enlightenment gave people, they wanted to be a little bit religious, but they didn't like the Haredim so much. So, like, they could be a little bit religious, they could be like a Frankist, the Frankists and the Shabtai Svi. It was a big, big movement that was going on over there. So basically, so you say, okay, bottom line is, we gotta end over here. So, what, was there Bjarnison Ipschitz? Was he a Shabtai Svi knight or, guy or not? Next. We're not getting involved, right? But, one thing is clear. He had a son. He had two sons. What was his son's name? Binyamin Wolf Eibshitz. And Binyamin Wolf Eibshitz was an open shop size three prophet. His son, no one had, there's no question about this one. His son was an open shop size three prophet. He, he said he's a reincarnation of shop size three. And he brought great, great embarrassment onto his family. And Rabbi Yair said Ibshitz was in a big, was, was stuck because he kept on, he had to sort of like bail his son out. And every time he bailed it out, people said, oh, look, you believe in Shabbat Shalom because you're bailing him out. But it was his son. So what should he do? So who was this, uh, 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 who was this uh, Benjamin Wolf Ibshitz? He had a huge castle where? In Transylvania. He had a huge castle. He's called the Baron Ibshitz. Until this day, there's a castle in Transylvania, which is Ro Romania, that is called the Baron, it's called the Eifert's Castle. It is huge. Now you'll say, oh, and he was a, he was a wanton, promiscuous McCubbel. That's what he was, a wanton, promiscuous McCubbel. He has books on Kabbalah, you can get at your local Kabbalah store, called Kabul Zev. But on the other hand, he was into the antinomian business and he had he had parties all day in his house, and he would give a sheer clothing on Kabbalah, and then he would do some pretty nasty things with women, and all the guys came, and it was a crazy, he had these rave parties. It was crazy what was going on over there. And this is all documented, this is not like, so you go, you have a, you had this, 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 but you had this by, by, by Wolf Ibsen, you had this exact business. McCubbel and knew a lot of Torah, but somehow other got mixed up with this doing a various Lashma and that, that getting the clippers out. And who was his good friend? His good friend was, first of all, Jacob Frank, because what happened was they, these guys needed a lot, a lot of money. So they kept on, uh, be, like you go to Gemachim and you need a guarantor. So Jacob Frank was a guarantor for, for, for this guy, Wolf Eipschitz. And Wolf Eipschitz was a guarantor. And then they all ran away with the money. No, no one ever paid anything back, right? It, it, was, it, was, it was a Ponzi scheme. It was disaster what was going on over here. So everyone was like, that's it. This, this is the nail in the coffin. If you, Rabbi Yonis and Eipschitz, have a son, that is an open, no, 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 no one argues about this one. This is not, a, this is not even a question. That was an open shop say three. Where did he pick this up from? Big up from his father, it must be there. Shot say, if you understand, actually, it was a closet, you know, shot say, Svi, and the son said, Be proud of who you are, let's get out of the closet, right? Right? That's, that's what that, uh, but the Haredim say, No, 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 just the opposite. That he, if you understand, actually, had nothing to do with shop say, Svi, but since his family got so persecuted, he was so persecuted, and he saw his father being so persecuted because of this, so he had some type of adverse effect. Don't ask me, I'm not into, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know, but somehow or other, because that he was falsely, his father was falsely accused, that had some reaction in his son, and he became a Shabbat prophet. No question, he said he's Mashiach, Shabbat prophet, the whole nine yards. Okay, so that's the werewolf 
uh, from Transylvania. Now, I, now you know why I refer to him like that. Now, we have to end over here. How much time we have? Over an hour. You know what? Once we went this far, we might as well finish. So let's just finish it off over here. Let's finish it off here. So what's the bottom line? Whatever happened to... Everyone knows about this uh, Benjamin Wolf Eibschitz. It's all over you. Put, a, put a name in Google. He's all over the place. Everyone knows this guy. The Baron, everyone knows him. Okay? He, now, but what, what is well accepted is that we don't call him just Benjamin. We call him Reb Benjamin Wolf Eibschitz at South. That's what we call him. Because what happened? Where's my papers? He did tshuva, everyone knows he did tshuva at the end, and it's well recorded that at the end of the day, here's the story, and I saw many different versions. Uh, the story is, Biodua, uh, it's well known that Yonatan had a son that went off the derech, big time. And uh, after a couple of years after Yonatan and Aisha died, he came to his son in a dream, and he said, you better do tshuva. And the son said, ah, leave me alone, Dad. I don't, I don't believe in dreams. The son came again. The father came again. The Rebbe Yenitzin Aibshitz came again. The Rebbe Yenitzin Aibshitz, in the dream, picked up an oven and said, I'm going to throw this on your head if you don't do tshuva. And he decided to do tshuva. He decided to do tshuva. Okay? This is well known, documented by the chassidim. And it's a sure he did tshuva. There's no question about that. Uh, the impetus is, they say, because of his dream. The father, the son asked the father, Hey, Rabbi Anderson, Dad, why are you only coming now? You died like 20 years ago. Why are you coming now? He says, I couldn't come because I was in Bezden with Yaakov Emden and we were sort of like in a Din Torah. So I couldn't get out from the Din Torah. And Yaakov Emden was getting in big trouble for making me do Bizzle Torah and Tzvila. So therefore, I couldn't come to get you to do Tshuva. So the son said, no. So what happened with Yaakov Emden? He got, he got a just dessert. So his father said, no. He got off, off the hook because he did a L'shem Shemaim. He really thought I was a shop like guy. But all his cronies and anyone who just got into the, the fray just for the fun of it, they're all going to hell. That's what he's, that's, that's the story. That's the story. Uh, I read a, a different story that, the same type of thing that, uh, that uh, he had a dream and, uh, and the same thing that the Yaakov Rebbe uh, actually came to him in a dream. And he asked Rabbi Yenison why are you only coming now? It happened to be at that point in time he lost all his money. He got caught. All the time the scheme sort of fell apart when he was 60 years old. He got caught. He was penniless at that point in time. He lost his castle. So his father said, if I would have came to you when you were rich, it wouldn't have helped. But now that you're down in the dump, I knew if I come to you in a dream now, you'll listen. Kachave, he became a, a, a well-known Malchuba. He got married at 60 years old. He got married at 60 years old and he had many kids. And there are kids from, uh, from this Reb Wolf. Uh, Eibshit. Actually, it was in the Yated Ne'eman, a couple of, uh, I remember reading it uh, two, three years ago, that um, he was 60 years old and he started dating. And what happened was he uh, couldn't find, he was going for one shidduch, one shidduch, one shidduch, one shidduch, until he finally he picked a girl. And they asked him, why do you, well, what took so long? And the good old days, you know, you could date one time and that's it, you know. He said, the guy's 60 years old, like, come on, right? So he said, because all the other girls, he told them on the date, you know, I'm really planning to go back to my old ways and living a very, a very lavish lifestyle. And they said, you know what, we're good wives, whatever you do, you do. And this one girl, her name was, uh, I wrote it down, uh, uh, let's see if I can find her name. They might as well say her right name here. Her, Michala Blach, or Black. She was, she was on a date with him, and he said, you know, you know, I, I'm putting on a show over here when we get married. I plan to go back to my old ways. She said, I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Stay sober. Like, oh, you're the one I want to marry. That's the story. That's the story. Now, that's the story with the Bijama Wolf Eichschitz. So it's really, really strange that after all this, his son, at least for a good portion of his life, was an, a va an open shop like speak guy. He doesn't make. What is the mascara? <laughs> what happened at the end of the day? What happened at the end of the day? So we have here. Two uh, well well known le legends. When so who died first? Rav Yaakov, uh, Rav Yaakov and Aishas died first. And uh, what happened was the Altona, the Altona, uh, 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 the Altona uh, graveyard, the cemetery is full to the brim. If you know, I went to, I went to the cemetery in Prague. They, they actually build on levels. They actually uh, they they had they had they had steps. They had a uh, rope. They had a different levels. 
the, the tombstones that you saw was actually the top level. They had dead people buried. They had, didn't have enough room. So what happened was that that they couldn't find a plate to bury the Yavit. They could only find a plate to bury him right next to Rabbi Yonathan, because they live in the same town. <laughs> next week, well, next week we do a little bit more business. They live in the same town. That's how it, they both from Altona. So they didn't know what to do. So the story went like this. That right before he died, the guy was like was about to die. He got up in bed and he said, Shalom Aleichem Abamari. He said to his, fa- to his father, Chacham Svi. He said, Shalom Aleichem Abamari. Marino Reb Tzvi. And then he turned the other way. Shalom Reb Yainasim. Baruch Haba Reb Yainasim. So the Chavar Kedisha heard that the Yaivit said, Baruch Haba Abi Mari, and Baruch Haba Reb Yainasim. So it happened to me the night that Yehuda was in town, and he said that he knows for a fact that they did Shalom, and that's how Reb Yainasim came to greet him, and that's why he said Baruch Haba Reb Yainasim, and therefore you could bury them right next to each other because they made Shalom. I think Rabbi Yadison came to uh, take it. To, according to the other legend, these are all legends. But according to the other legend, he took it to bring him to court. So they're, you know, in the in, in the in the Shemayim Samala. But this is the this is the most accepted level uh, legend, and they are. You go to Altona burial. They're buried right next to each other. I was not there, but I saw, I saw the pictures. They have the pictures. It's right next to each other, literally right next to each other. Like a, a couple of graveyards away, a couple of tombstones away. And now you the Paskin that they did Shalom, and in Reh Gev and in Reh Evan, Rabbi and the, the Yairis and, and, and Reb Aichet became best friends. And so it is, that's one legend. There's another legend, which doesn't really, doesn't really work so much with this legend. We'll see why in a minute. But the Chassam Seifer would never put in the same shelf the Pnei Yeshua and the Crazy Placey and the uh, Shilas Yairis. He would never put them in the same shelf. The, the Pnei Yeshua, we said, uh, put the uh, crazy placey. Crazy placey is Rabbi Yonatan Ipshitz in uh, in Cherim. So he wouldn't put them in ever in the same shelf. One day a student comes in and sees the Sam Slaver putting them in the same shelf. He sounds like, what are you doing? He says, No, I just had a, 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 a mala came to me or I had a real credit. I just found out they actually did Shalom and we're allowed to put them now in the same shelf. So if you come to Yeshiva and see a crazy placey and a Pnei shoe in the same shelf, don't go worry, don't go crazy. Or you see the Sheila Yavitz and the Crazy Placey or whatever it is, and Yaris Vas the same. You don't gotta worry about it. Yeah, these are all wonderful legends and it's great, but if you realize they're conflicting a little bit. Because the one legend says, oh, I was fighting, I was fighting with him for the last 20 years. I couldn't come to you in the dream. One legend says, when, when, when Reb, uh, by the time Reb Yaakov Emden died, they already did peace. It sounds like we lived 60, 70 years later. Safe lived uh, uh, 17, uh, 1762. That means uh, basically, basically he he, li- he was alive. He was two years old when they were alive. So basically, Safe Safe all his life was not putting them to the farm together, and then he started putting them together. That means they made Shalom later on. So these are conflicting legends, uh, but we'll just go out and say that they did Shalom, and therefore. We, uh, as a Haredim, we say we don't get involved, as you see, we will not get involved in any of this. I refuse to talk about this, as you see. But just that we should know a little bit, a little bit, the background. We should be told Amaratsin. We should know that there is this issue in the world. But, um, Baruch Hashem, we learn everything. Shil Shavitz, Pnei Yeshua, Crazy Placey. I find Shil. And uh, so we'll stop over here. I didn't, I didn't do everything, but I did a lot. I did a lot. And believe me, the next year, uh, next week, <laughs> we'll, we'll start about the brain thing. But we'll give there's, there's more background you have to know. There's actually a background to this background story. There's a, there's a background to the background. We'll get to that next week. And okay, we'll stop here.